Martin, what can I say? That was a knockout presentation, and uh, I hope everybody listens to your lead. Thank you for an amazingly insightful uh, set of remarks. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite Charlie Hockless to uh, the podium. Charlie, with Vessel's value, he is going to take us to the next topic, opportunities and risk, and uh, taking a look at the key data. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Shanghai, and uh, it's a privilege to share the stage with such illustrious members of our, of our industry. Uh, my name is Charlie Hockless, and I'm from Vessels Value. And uh, my presentation this morning is titled Opportunities and Risk, Taking a Look at the Key Data. Now, we work in a very volatile market, and with this comes many different opinions from analysts and market commentators alike. And what this results in is a lot of noise. But where should we be looking within this noise in order to find the signals on which to base investment decisions? This is what I'll be running you through this morning. So for the bulker, tanker, container, gas, and offshore, I'll be looking at three key factors. These three key factors to look for, the short-term valuation trend, so this will represent spot market returns, the discount from long-term median value, which will give the position of the asset in terms of its asset value cycle, and also I'll be looking at supply and demand. So the last, uh, the last year's supply growth in ton miles versus the growth in the fleet size. But firstly, uh, a quick uh, sort of recap on who Vessels Value are and what our services entail. So we offer daily, historic, uh, daily updated and historic valuations for all vessel types, our own uh, mapping and a tracking tool, our, our commercial and our proprietary uh, shipping database, and also our trade and analytics tool. Uh, we launched in 2011 with four people, we're now over 160 in eight offices worldwide, uh, including our Asia headquarters in Singapore and our commercial headquarters in London. We work with around 400 subscribing companies, and that equates to around 2,000 users, split between 50% banks and funds and leasing companies, around 33% ship owners operators, and 18% the rest, which is uh, professional services, brokers, lawyers, etc. Anyway, now on to the important stuff. So I'll start with the tanker sector, uh, which has experienced, let's say, mixed results over the last few years, um, but has seen some significant gains in value, as we will see. Uh, I also believe this, will, this sector in particular will be on the forefront of the change felt by IMO 2020 when that arrives. So the graph behind me shows uh, a five-year-old fixed-stage tanker of each different subtype. And it's valued every day at five years old, going back in time historically, on this graph back to 2015. What this shows is the position within the asset value cycle, and basically what's been going on in the market over the last five years. As you can see on, you know, for example, VLCCs have experienced a 16% rise in value over the last calendar year. And that extends downward, you see the Suez Max as well, Aframax, LRs, etc. Uh, worth looking out for the Aframax, as this is the interesting story behind the tanker sector. Looking at the last three months, we see that the changes are more modest, still with the VLCCs increasing by 2.5%, which is quite impressive, I think. And what does this look like in terms of uh, a practical example? Well, I've taken the Indigo Nova, which is the ex Tamagawa. Uh, this ship was transacted last month at $36 million. We can see today that it's valued at $38 million. It's really demonstrating the strength that we've seen in terms of the tanker values in the last uh, few months, particularly in the last month as well. But how well was this timed? So where's the opportunity or was this a risk? Looking at this graph, the purple or the blue line is the value going back in time. 
The red line is the current value where it's currently sat, and the yellow line is the median value. What, would this, what this would suggest to me is that perhaps, yes, the uh, chip was transacted recently and it has risen sharply in value from the 36 million we've seen, but I think to me it's coming uh, rather close to the medium value, which could suggest that the market is coming up to its peak and perhaps these types of ships will not continue to rise in such a way. Looking at the rest of the tanker sector, so this is a five-year-old, for sake of ease, a five-year-old fixed-age ship, and this is its current market value versus the historical median value. Uh, so as we see, the VLCC is almost 6% above their historical median for a five-year-old. Suez Max is a young asset type, but operating at 15% above uh, its, current, its median value. But where the interesting story is, is the Aframax and the LR1s operating at under around 9%, so almost 10% below their historical median value. This is where the story gets interesting on the tanker side, particularly for the Aframax sector. So what the graph behind me shows is the, uh, is the last year's tonne mile demand growth versus the vessel supply growth. Uh, so as you see, the VLCCs have experienced basically uh, no growth whatsoever in terms of their tonne mile demand, um, but their vessel supply has increased by around 2.5%. So that's what the graph is showing. Looking at the Aframax sector, we've seen very minimal growth in supply, but a huge growth, well, 5% growth in vessel demand. Moving on to the bulker sector. So this sector, as we see, has seen as um, experienced headwinds over the last uh, few quarters. For reasons not limited to um, Vale, the mine and the dam disasters there, and the US-China trade war, which has been affecting the smaller grain-carrying tonnage. In this time, we've also seen the Baltic Dry Index drop below 600 points, and we saw a gap of around 120 days with no Cape size transactions at all. And what's this done to the values? Well, we see that over the last year, it doesn't look too bad. So we only have a difference of 3% for the large capes, but as you can see in between that gap, we have a, had, a, had seen a sharp rise and then indeed a sharp fall, which will be represented in this three-month uh, change, where we see the cape size has gone down by almost 10% in the last three months. We can also see that that's extended to the smaller vessel types. What does this look like in terms of a practical example? Well, what this example shows is the importance of timing. So this is another way of looking at opportunity. We have the Amarito Cape size. She's uh, just over seven years old and has today a value of over $28.5 million. So she was transacted back in 2016 at $22 million uh, by Mr. Maranakis at Capital Maritime and then sold, despite aging another two years, at $32 million, uh, in December 2018, which really shows the potential opportunity if you time your asset play correctly. But where is she now in terms of her fixed age value? Um, so as we can see, she's risen above her median value on the long term, which could, well, which could question the timing of the purchase, but definitely supports the timing of the sale back in December of, this year, of last year. When we expand this to the rest of the bulk sector, we can see that Cape size is very marginally uh, above their historical median value. But interestingly, Panamax, Supermax, around 4% below their median value. And then the real story here is with the handy size bulkers, which are at, operating at 18% below their median value. How is the story reinforced in terms of the supply and demand? Well, you see Cape size, Panamax, the larger, the larger tonnage, a lot more supply growth than there is demand growth on the ton mile perspective. Uh, handy size growth, we've seen around 2% growth in demand, but also the supply is there as well. But, you know, it's a strong market there as the supply is not eclipsing demand. Continuing on with the container sector, 
Now, containers have seen issues really no fault of their own over, I'd say, the last well, six months or a year as global trade has slowed down. Uh, we've also seen a structural shift in pricing as the uh, industry looks more towards the Far East for their expansion of their fleets. What we see here is the post Panamax ships having increased by 10%, but at the same time, the smaller ships having gone down by 12 and 17% respectively. However, this is really, I think, due to the uh, excitement there was with the smaller container ships around this time last year that they have fallen in, in such a way. Interestingly enough, the handy size containers there have come up by 12.5% in the last quarter alone. What's being seen here? Is there, is there an opportunity? Is there a risk? I'll look at the Apostolos 2. It's a uh, handy container built in 2008, around 10 years old. 8.3 well, million she's currently valued at. And she was bought in December of 2018 at 9 million, once again, to Mr. Maranakis. And what has he seen in this transaction? Is there an opportunity here? Well, we'll take a look at her fixed age. Uh, so we fixed her age at what it is currently, around 10 years old, valued her back in time, and this is the result that we see. You see that the red line is far below, which is the current value, is far below the median value at 13.5 million, so there's potential for a large upside there. How are these ships valued uh, on a larger scale uh, versus their historical median across the board? Well, we see post Panamaxes are you know, much, much below, handy size 14.5% below their historical median, but also the feeder maxes around 25% there below their median value. This is where the interesting story is told, once again by the demand. So we see that feeder max demand has increased slightly and it is, over, it is more superior than the supply of vessels. Not, very, not a good story told by the handies, and they are down in demand, but increased in supply. Now, moving swiftly on to the gas sector. The gas sector is a very interesting market, in my opinion. Um, you know, going to the theme of uh, Martin's presentation of sustainability, cleaner fuels, this industry is going to, be, is going to play a very important part in the future of our industry. Um, but for such a hot market, we haven't seen much change in terms of the values, uh, only 2% across the board um, for the LNG sector. But there is a reason for this. Uh, as the market hots up, new building slots are open, yards are competitive. They're looking for the business, and with that, the prices are remaining competitive on the new building side, which is putting pressure on the second-hand values. Where are we in terms of their current market value versus historical median? I don't think this is hugely important because these ships aren't widely traded. They're often operated on long-term charters. How I see this market developing is more sale and purchase activity and a spot market emerging. So this graph, I think, will become more interesting as time passes. But this is the true story of the LNG market. We see the strong demand there for LN large LNG and the mid-size LNG, both eclipsing the supply, particularly mid-size LNG, which is seeing a reduction in, in supply. Um, Sizable demand on the large LNG, almost 17%. Um, strangely enough, small-scale LNG but have grown a lot in, uh, in terms of their supply. Demand also there. However, I would very much expect... Uh, this graph to be all green really going forward for the next five to ten years. I really think that this is going to be a very pinnacle industry uh, going forward. Swiftly looking on to the, uh, M to the LPG values, and I'll just pick out the interesting point from this graph. I would advise you to look at the medium gas carriers, so the MGCs, which have risen 10% in the last year. Over the last three months, have remained flat. They sit currently around, well, just over 4% below their median, long-term median value. I mean, alarmingly enough, there's the VLGCs at uh, above 9% above their median value, which is not a great sign. And then we'll look into the tonne mile growth versus supply growth. 
looking at those MGCs, they've seen a huge spike in demand, which is um, not caught up by the supply of ships. So there's definitely a possibility there. Um, other tonnage on this sector not looking too great in terms of the demand. Now, moving on to the damsel in distress of our industry, uh, the offshore sector. Uh, so, we're likely to see a lot of opportunity and risk in this sector, purely because of what's happened in the last, well, five years since the market collapsed in 2015. As you can see, right on the left-hand side of this graph, the values that were sort of, I mean, just, that was just after the crash, so the values were healthy-ish at that point, but we see how much they've come down. It almost gives no meaning to the values uh, on the right-hand side of the graph, just because the market is bottoming out. And at this point, particularly on the supply boat side, the PSVs, the HTSs, these ships are moving nominally in terms of value. You know, that 16% does not represent a large number. Also, we see in the last three months the changes that have happened, uh, particularly in the jack-up sector, those values have moved down uh, due to a couple of transactions from uh, Far Eastern um, owners, particularly resales of jack-ups. Um, one in particular, the Hakuru jack-up, the Hakuru 15, felt, uh, caused the values to fall sharply. But what does this look like in terms of um, potential opportunity? Well, I've taken the Enna Shogun, which is the ex Sanko Energy, valued today at 5.3 million USD. She was sold back in 2017 at 5.8 million dollars to Eastern Navigation, showing that the values have really just remained particularly stagnant over the last three years. But it also represents a potential opportunity for this reason here. We have the current value, as you can see, the yellow, the red line, much, much below the medium value at, you know, five times, over five times the, the current value. So if you manage to pick up an asset of this type without, you know, debt-free, good condition, there's certainly an opportunity there, um, but it should be properly managed, otherwise it could be a risk. This doesn't, this graph doesn't make for great reading, but um, as you can see, the offshore assets are valued much far below the historical medians across the board. However, this could also present an opportunity if you're picking up one of these assets in a debt-free situation, ready to ride the market up, as hopefully it should do uh, over the coming years. So, as already been covered by some of the speakers today, we are in a precarious position in terms of the, globe, the general shipping markets. There is opportunity, there is risk, but there is also a lot of change about to happen, particularly with IMO 2020 lo looming. No one really knows what sort of aspect, this, uh, what effect this is going to happen um, to the global industry, and it's very tough to predict, especially um, with the US-China trade war seemingly intensifying, as I've seen this week. So we'll see how that goes. But what we can use is the data. So what I've chosen from uh, my presentation that we've based on our, on our data is that we could see opportunities in the handy bulker sector, the Aframax tankers, feeder max containers, uh, large and mid-sized LNG, and the MGC LPG carriers. I've put offshore in there. You know, it, could, it does appear on both slides, um, but it could be seen as a potential opportunity as there is large upside potential uh, depending on whether you get the right deal or not. And the risks. So, alarmingly, well, interestingly enough, it's the larger tonnage. Um, so, we have this sort of uh, thing in shipping where we, you know, we put the, all the money into the larger tonnage. That seems like the safest bet. And it does result in chronic oversupply. And this is, I think, what we're seeing, um, seeing here. So, that would be interesting to see how that develops. The only thing bucking the trend here is the handy containers, and obviously I have offshore, which could be seen as a large risk and should potentially be avoided altogether. Anyway, thank you for your kind attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.